it was very, very shocking and, and everyone's eyes were, were peeled and watching. Um, I remember his funeral procession that turned into a protest where people were gathered for him. It started with family and friends, but then people you know, rallied together as they heard why and what happened and, and the aftermath. On December 17, 2010, Mohamed Bouazizi, a Tunisian street vendor, set himself on fire outside a government building. It was an act of despair to protest government corruption and mass unemployment in Tunisia. His act would be a catalyst that would spark a nationwide revolution toppling Tunisian President Zain al Abidin bin Ali and ignite mass protests across the Middle East and North Africa that would later be known as the Arab Spring. Tunisians, by and large, are educated. They go to university. There was plenty of, you know, plenty of different programs to pursue. Lots of people with, you know, um, higher education degrees, PhDs even, who for years and years would remain unemployed. Um, and before the revolution had no recourse. I mean, they just had to keep trying, had to keep retaking this exam that they know they should have passed, but because they didn't pay this bribe or because they didn't, because they just come from the wrong family, they're just never going to pass. It's not hard to imagine why people couldn't find jobs or why it was difficult for entire regions to uplift themselves out of um, poverty when, you know, the roads leading in and out of different towns are, you know, chock full of potholes and, and they could barely get electricity. Um, there were entire, you know, swaths of the country that we basically never really visited um, before the revolution or people just kind of wrote off because they were so poor, there was nothing going on there, there was no infrastructure or, or industry, um, and it was the majority of the country. The Ben Ali family was involved in every aspect of, you know, even normal people. They would intervene in the smallest of projects, not even, they don't have to be big projects that they're involved in. They're just involved in every project, um, you know, taking part in everything, stealing from everyone, um, and everyone was aware of that, and probably that's what really united us in 2010, 2011. Uh, it wasn't just, you know, for, for some, they were not really interested in politics, they were fine with the dictatorship, but they were not fine with this family intervening in their projects and intervening in the economic life. Most, most Tunisians were, were struggling. Um, if you didn't have money, if you didn't have connections, and that was the majority of the people, um, you just kind of had to, you just kind of existed. Um, and just kind of, there was, you know, and remains a huge black market. So people, you know, if they can't find jobs the conventional way, you know, obviously are going to try to, you know, they have to support themselves, their families, you know, young people, they want to get married, they want to start their lives. So Bratizi was one of the street sellers uh, selling fruits um, in Sidi Bouzid in central Tunis. And obviously he did not have any permission to do that because he, he, he doesn't have like a proper shop to do that. And these people to this day, ironically, are still being, you know, um, you know, um, you know, they're not really allowed to do that. Street vendors do not have any uh, legal status to do what they're doing. So he was being chased by the police and local authorities uh, in the municipality of Sidi Bouzid. And uh, it was not the first time. They kept, you know, confiscating his goods and, you know, preventing him from, you know, doing what he's doing. Bouazizi was assaulted by a police officer after he refused to offer a bribe to get his scale back. He went to the town's local government building to complain but officials refused to listen. Frustrated and desperate, Bazizi went to a gas station, brought a canister of petrol, and returned to the government building, where he self-immolated. When it came to economic rights, um, everybody was really impacted in Tunisia in one way or the other by the family of Ben Ali. You know, what happened was the culmination of everything that was already happening because we keep saying that Bazizi was like, you know, what ignited the entire revolution, what sparked it, but Still, there was like many stories like Bazizi and Pening, and that was like the, um, you know, the straw that broke the camel's back, as we say. Bazizi's actions sent shockwaves throughout the country. Tunisians identified with his pain and anger, the crushing economic reality he couldn't escape, the government corruption and ineptitude he fought against every day. This was not a new sentiment in Tunisian society, but Bazizi's act of desperation made it impossible to ignore. 
it was really a matter of time when people would finally sort of just have enough. I mean, how much could you possibly take of being, you know, put down, ignored, told to, you know, mind your business, just keep your head down? How could you, how, how much longer could you do that? Why would you, what is there to live for if you can't, you know, aspire to something? It's no wonder that other Tunisians were just so captivated and, and, and saw themselves in his story. This poor man who was just trying to make a living for himself, and it just, um, and he comes from a very, uh, or he came, Allah from a very um, uh, a poor region, very underdeveloped region, mostly agricultural, and, um, and it just resonated with a lot of people. Things reached a tipping point when the government began to violently crack down on protests. Armed police and snipers fired live ammunition into crowds. The young protesters, armed with their phones and social media accounts, began to record and document police attacks and share them widely. They also used them to coordinate protest movements and strategize. It was a really, it was a really wonderful time of people finally seeing each other, finally really looking at each other with, with fresh eyes and with understanding. And so the veil had dropped or was beginning to drop and people could finally acknowledge, appreciate and, and share. Um, it, was, it was an incredible time. Ben Ali struggled to contain the blossoming protest movement, which now sprang out of public squares across the country. He accused them of being foreign agents and threatened a harsher security response. When that failed, he attempted to appease them, promising to end police crackdowns, create 200,000 new jobs, and even promised he wouldn't run in the next elections. <laughs> But it was too late. Tunisians were adamant they would continue. After 28 days of mass protest, Ben Ali resigned on January 14, 2011, before fleeing the country to Saudi Arabia. He had been president of Tunisia for more than 23 years. For me, as for many others, um, I mean, I think it, our lives have changed just like radically, you know? Um, so we're allowed to join the parties we want to be in, we're allowed to, you know, work in the places we want to work in. Social life, political life, economic life, cultural, everything is thriving, everything is fully functioning. Before, it wasn't like this at all. Ten years on since the death of Boazizi, many see Tunisia as a success story in the region, while their Arab Spring peers in Syria, Libya, Yemen and Egypt so their revolutionary hopes crushed by civil war and counter-revolution, Tunisians persisted through political turmoil and managed to retain their most basic demands. Civil liberties, free press, freedom of assembly, and a democratic process. Um, and people can now say that, and that's a huge step forward. You can now lobby your government. You have representatives who represent you, who you can vote in and out of office, and that has real consequence. I mean, these are... These are very real um, uh, things that have immediate sort of repercussions and, and consequences for, for the average person and, and they can see that. I think that's why, that's, that is why I remain so um, optimistic and so um, I am proud of what Tunisians were able to do um, in spite of everything that still remains to be done. Um, I think that it, it, it's, it's you know, the, the obstacles that we've overcome and that we're still working on are worth it. And they make, you know, the difficulties worth it.